It's amazing that explaining life's immense diversity All comes down to some genetics and some biochemistry And life on earth is just one family And what's true for you is true for all biology Hello, I'm Robin Ince. Welcome to Genetic Shambles, presented by the Cosmic Shambles Network and also the Genetic Society and the Milner Centre for Evolution at the University of Bath. Over the first four episodes of this series, we've looked at COVID-19, historic epidemics, human evolution and the human genome. And in each episode, we've invariably talked about sequencing, sequencing genomes and the DNA of living things. So we thought it was time to discuss the very act of sequencing itself. What is it? How do we do it? Why do we do it? And how can we get better as the technology improves? First up, I spoke to Mark Blackster, who's an evolutionary biologist at the Sanger Institute, where he's the leader of the Tree of Life project. And I started by asking him, just what do we mean in the world of genetics and evolution when we say sequencing? OK, so DNA, which is in all of our cells, um, and, and in cells of all living organisms, um, is an intensely boring molecule. And it's so boring when it was first discovered and people started thinking about genetics and heredity. DNA is so boring that nobody believed that it could be the mechanism of heredity because it's, it's quite a boring molecule. It's a very long molecule. Um, so it's our, our, our genomes are three billion uh, subunits of a particular type of sugar strung together in one long molecule. Well, it's actually in 23 long molecules. So, so it's a relatively boring molecule, but it is made out of simple subunits, simple uh, components. The, the recipe for DNA is quite simple. And the way we uh, represent that when we talk about it is we call it the, the bases, so the, which is a chemical component. We give them letter names A, G, C, and T. And if you read along the molecule, my DNA will go A, G, C, T, T, G, C, G, 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 C, C, C. So sequencing a genome is just writing down on a piece of paper in the old days or sucking into a computer. Now, the order of the letters along the DNA molecule, those letters correspond to particular chemicals, and those chemicals are read by the cell. That, that linear order of chemicals is read by the cell to instruct it to make proteins, to make RNAs, and to make cells and bodies and, and uh, interviewers. So the uh, how true is it? I remember reading someone quite early on who, who uh, in terms of the sequencing of the human genome, who said, I've now realized that what we've actually got is it's the equivalent of having all of the letters that are in the book, The Brothers Karamazov, but we now have to work out the order of them to make the sentences so that we actually find mm. the meaning. Yeah. So if you just look at the letters that are present, I mean, our, our alphabet has 26. Um, there are only four letters in the DNA alphabet. So it is intensely boring in that way. Um, uh, so what we're interested in is, is what the letters in that order mean. So yes, it is very much an, an issue of um, trying to read the book of life, read the, the letters, the string of letters, and try and work out what is meant by them. And the meaning is not any greater meaning. It's a biological sense, which is uh, what can this make in a biological world? So our sequencing procedure it would be lovely if we had a machine or a technology that you could take a chromosome and you could carefully poke it in the machine and press go, and it would read all 250 million letters that correspond to that chromosome in one go. Unfortunately, we can't do that. Um, it's a dream that we will be able to, and there are technologies out there. There is a company called Oxford Nanopore, technologies who have a, a, a reader which can read a million letters at once, which is pretty good. Uh, amazing, in fact. Um, so what we tend to do is we read it in little short segments. So it's not really like chopping it up into letters, but it's like chopping it up into sentences or chopping, tearing the pages out of the Book of Life and scattering them and then trying to put the book back together at the end. Um, and so that's a a problem which is getting easier and easier because computers are getting better and better. But the, the sequencing procedure 
is basically taking the DNA, chopping it up into bits which are short enough for us to read in one go, giving all those bits to our computer, and the computer working out how they overlap and reconstructing the book. So how do you, I mean, in terms of the actual process, yep. what is done? How, how are you able to, to okay. read that language? Yeah, uh, it's uh, technology so advanced that it appears as magic even to me. <laughs> <laughs> so there are, there are three main ways to do it. Three, three weapons, three main weapons. Um, one is a technology called Sanger sequencing, which was invented, um, well, 50 years ago now by a guy called uh, Fred Sanger, and that's where the place I work, the Sanger Institute, is named after him. Um, and that uses a, a process a process of copying the DNA, just as like a cell would copy its own DNA when it was going to divide, copying the DNA, but adding a synthetic chemical that allows us to read off what each base is, what each letter is as it comes past. So there's some technical bits about how we do that. But that Sanger sequencing technology is the technology that was used to sequence the human genome the first time around. Uh, it's the technology that's been used to sequence the vast, vast majority of the million or so human genomes that have now been sequenced. There are two newer technologies that have come up. One uses something which really is magic to me called zero-mode waveguides. It's that thing where light is a particle and a wave. Ah, <laughs> my head breaks. Um, but basically, um, we can label the precursors for DNA with a little fluorescent tag. And we can synthesize, well, we can make a copy of a piece of DNA um, and incorporate these fluorescent tags. And for the milliseconds that that fluorescent tag is inside the enzyme that's making the DNA, you put UV light along the bottom, which is photons, and they go in a straight line. And the zero-mode waveguide is just above the beam of light. And some of the light diffuses through a hole, a tiny, tiny, tiny hole. And because that hole is, is about the same size as the wavelength of light, it doesn't go very far and it illuminates. The, and so we can count the color, because we tag it with fluorescence, the color of the letters as they're added and read it out. Okay, And that allows you to make really long sequencing reads. Um, so 20 kilobases, 50 kilobases. So that's amazing. And that is amazing physics applied to biology. And the third method is this method that Oxford Nanopore uses, which is um, also amazing. Um, it has a, a tiny little hole in a synthetic lipid membrane, so a, a, a membrane between two buffers, and a tiny little hole called a pore. And the DNA is sucked through the pore. And as it goes through the pore, it stops the flow of hydrogen ions. So it stops the flow of current through the pore. So if there's no DNA, the pore is open, the hydrogen ions flood through. And as the DNA goes through, it stops the flow of hydrogen ions. And if the, the letters in the base, the letters in the DNA, the letters in the sequence, mean that the shape of the DNA going through the pore is different. And so it changes the, the, changes the current ever so slightly, depending on whether it's four A's in a row or four Gs in a row, or a GC, GC, or an AT, AT. And so you can read the sequence like that. And that technology is technically only limited by the length of the DNA you can make. So if you give it a million base pair fragment, and the fragment goes in, it'll keep sucking it through for a million reads, a million letters. So um, yeah, so that technology can quite easily generate 100,000 base reads. Um, Trouble is they're not very accurate compared to the Sanger sequencing, which is super accurate, and the, the PAT bio is approximately in the middle of those two. So we've got those three methods. They're complementary. We use them in different ways to build to build genomes when we try and sequence them. And they're all they're all magic. I mean, Sanger they do. Uh, well, what I particularly enjoy was your demonstration of the nanopore one as well. You actually have the magic gesticulation that is normally used to make a handkerchief disappear. So yeah. as you were doing that, I think at any moment now he's going to pull out the flags from the world from his T-shirt. This is a fantastic thing we to watch. We have a rabbit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Zero mode waveguides really are magic. They are spooky action at a distance type stuff because their wave is, you know, light is a wave and a particle. And it yeah, works. I've, I've, and, it, and it works beautifully. I mean, these, these machines are production instruments. They're not mad scientist things that work on Tuesdays and never on any other day of the week. They are 
really wonderful instruments. So, I just because you're working the project, which has the title Tree of Life. How does the Tree of Life change from when we when we think of those sketches in 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 Darwin's notebooks and those are how what is the Tree of Life if it is a tree now compared to 1859? Oh wow! So one we know of many more species. Two, we know of much more diversity. Um, there was a huge revolution in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s of the last century, um, last millennium, um, uh, where we rearranged a lot of the, our ideas about how things were related. So what we have now is a really detailed picture of, of how different groups of organisms are related to each other. And some of those have been really surprising. So things that we thought were whole separate phyla, so or groups of organisms in a very different body plan turn out to be just weird representatives of something quite boring. So there's a, there's a whole group of parasitic jellyfish which have undergone huge reduction in the complexity of their bodies and um, they, they have parts of their life cycle where there are only a few cells. But it turns out really, at heart, in their DNA, they're just jellyfish doing something particularly exciting, but they're just jellyfish. So so I think I think... One of the things we've been able to do is, is in large measure, sort it out. You also mentioned this idea that it's maybe not a tree, and that's very true. In terms of if we were trying to place in our mind an effective image of how life develops, mutation rates, natural selection, right. and where that leads, now that we can't have the tree, what is the image you can place in our mind? I, I think it's still a tree, but just like um, real trees, you sometimes get branches which meet each other and uh, blend into each other. Um, that's actually what we have as well. I, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that the whole tree is a network or a web. But there are connect unexpected connections between things which branched a long time ago and then come back together again. So it's almost like taking a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional real tree, which really is bifurcating you know, a tree. And in the picture, things overlap. And so there's lots of cases where there are is evidence for transfer of DNA of genes between organisms which apparently separated on the tree a long time ago. There's still a tree underneath. And the tree is still the best way of describing it, but we've got to recognise that there are these horizontal links as well as the vertical ones. The uh, what, what is the, the the tree of life then? What are you trying to? You, you're mentioning Fred Sanger. You're at the the Sanger Institute, aren't you? Yeah. And uh, what, what is the the tree of life um, aiming to achieve? Yeah. So um, at base, we want to sequence the genomes. So then the, the the DNA inside every species on planet Earth. Okay, so that's a small objective. There are about 1.5 million or possibly 6 million species we don't really know. Um, so the idea is that by understanding the genomes of these organisms, we could transform the way we do science. So I, in my career, have watched the bits of biology I've been interested in. I've been working with parasites of humans for many years, for example. And the new science, the new biology, the new understanding you get once you have the genome to base your ideas on is transformative and so if you look back at the, the human genome project sequencing that human genome um, has transformed the way we do medicine and it's transformed the way we do biomedical science it's transformed our understanding of our our own bodies and we want to do that for all of biology so that transformation so our goal is to generate the sequences and we're going to be doing genome science on them, doing all the sorts of exciting biology that, well, all the sort of biology that we think is exciting. But the idea is they're then there as a platform for everybody to do everything else they want on. So that might be people working in conservation. They now have the genomes of the organisms that live in their reserve or their wildlife park. They can go and hunt for them by looking for their DNA. It's quite easy to find DNA in the wild. Or they can look at the DNA of... Uh, all the individuals that they of this endangered species they have in their in their park work out which ones are related and whether they should be worried about inbreeding or whether they can spot any upcoming problems. So we hope to help conservation and biodiversity. Um, we hope to help bio industry. Think about all the different things that organisms can do that we just marvel at. There are there are annelid worms in the mud, which have jaws where they've 
chelated metal ions along with proteins, and those jaws are harder than steel. And the jaws are used for eating other things, and they're very small. But there's a biomaterial programmed by a genome which we've no idea how to make. I mean, it's a real surprise, these things are hard. Think about spider silk. Spiders make lots of different sorts of silk, sticky ones, bouncy ones, strong ones, stretchy ones, light ones, heavy ones. And different species make different silks in different ways. Imagine if you had a whole library of silks, genes, which you could then use in biotechnology to make um, clothes, to make rubber, to make plastic. What are we going to do when the oil runs out? What well, maybe we can have bio-produced silks and rubbers and materials made from this diversity. And because we know what the, silk, the silks are used for by the spiders, we can actually, if you like, almost dial up whatever cloth or property we want. We say we want something that's stretchy but very strong. We want something that's sticky but not stretchy. We want something that's um, got a lot of resilience, something that doesn't wet very well very easily that stays dry even if you put it in water and we go oh yep this one will do there you go so bio biopharmaceuticals biomimetics biomaterials and i think just like in the human genome project um there was a lot of uh, worry about what we would do with all this data when we got it and where we are now looking back 20 years is that this data has been transformative i mean that the sequence has been transformative it suddenly allowed us to see the way we work in ways that we never saw before. So we hope to do that for the whole of the whole of biology, I say to people when I'm promoting the project. It's a bit grand. Um, we're starting small. We're sequencing Britain, the species that live in Britain and Ireland. So that's about <clears throat> 60,000 species in total. Um, a nice small amount compared to 6 million or 1.5 million, but uh, a doable amount. Brilliant. I can't ask you anything after that. That's such a grand conclusion. There you you go. know, I mean, I'd love you to explain why butterflies are. Will we ever understand? Still, I was thinking about that the other day as I looked one. I still find that I'm sure there's stranger things in nature, but the transformation from what appear to be to uh, two entirely different species yeah. in, in the eyes is, is still one of those bits where you go, this is just it. Mutation heredity actually goes very intriguing places. It does, and and I think that's that's um uh. There's, there's lovely line, nature will find a way, which is a bit Jurassic Park. Yeah, you remember that bit in Jurassic Park mm -hmm. where, where um, you know, they say basically the reason that they became uh, pathogenetic is because that's life. Life tries to foster itself. And I think any space that's available, life will evolve to fit it. Yeah. So there are bacteria out there which are really good at eating plastic. You know, we've given we've put enough plastic into the environment that it's it's been an evolutionarily successful strategy to evolve plastic eating yeah so they, th those bacteria will have a short lifespan because either human society collapses and we make no more plastic or we move to spider silk plastics or something um but na na evolution um just by sampling and sampling and sampling will find a way to do almost anything. Our next guest is Dr Lucy Van Dorp, Senior Research Fellow at the University College London Genomic Institute. Her work involves looking at the sequences of often ancient DNA and past infectious diseases so we can better understand the diseases and pandemics that affect human populations today like COVID-19. So we began by talking about how Lucy's work on tackling these new DNA and genomic sequences starts off. I really would like to know this almost bit by bit in terms of how it starts. What is the narrative of trying to put together that story? Yeah, I think it's, it is a narrative and, and all the work that I do is using genomes as one way of reconstructing that narrative. So certainly in the context of infectious diseases, we have them recorded throughout history. We have anecdotes, we have medical records, we have this wealth of information um, but what I focus on is, is the genomes, because in my eye, that presents a kind of um, unbiased account of the history of a pathogen. And that history might be from the time at which it first emerged and started infecting humans, whether that was thousands of years ago or something which happened much more recently, for example, what we're, we're just experiencing. 
And we can use the genetic data alone with perhaps some other information, for example, when a sample is collected or where in the world it's collected to reconstruct um, emergence, timings, transmission and also spread. And it's based really on the simple premise that um, two samples from a pathogen or from two humans or any other species that are more closely related to each other will be genetically more similar. And so if I was to transmit a pathogen to you, then that pathogen genome would be more similar between us than it would be than, for example, any other two genomes. So when you talk about, for instance, being able to pinpoint emergence, how, when you are able to see the genome, how are you able to mark those kind of, the, the, how are you able to take that information? And again, go here, this is where, this is the area here. Yeah, so it's, um, I guess, a fundamental property of evolution as, as time goes on, as generations pass, mutations can emerge. Um, and I think it's really important to point out that mutations are a natural byproduct of evolution and they're really useful for what we do in terms of inferring histories and transmission. Um, and so we can use that as a legacy of, of um, how a virus or a different any species really has evolved. And so by tracking those mutations through time and, and in particular by making some assumptions and, and one of which is as time goes on, we have more mutations. That's one of the assumptions we make, which is not a bad one. Um, we can then start to calibrate the histories of different species by time. Um, so I guess one example, of course, is the SARS-CoV-2 virus responsible for COVID-19. And there we have tens of thousands of genomes sampled from really early on in the pandemic. The first genomes, maybe the 6th of January, all the way through till genomes that were kind of made available a couple of days ago. And so that gives us a time course of tracking mutations as they um, evolve, as the virus evolves over that time period and allows us to ask, well, when has every virus that we've sequenced, when did it last share a common ancestor? So when do those mutations track back to zero? Um, and that's one of the, the mechanisms we've been using to try and estimate um, the origin, the time when we think that this circulating virus jumped into the human population. And um, our estimates and quite a few other estimates from, from other researchers as well are all pointing towards kind of October, November time last year. So um, recently is, is a, a, good, um, a good answer. But of course, this is useful because it implies that if we have someone saying, well, you know, last um, August, I had a terrible cold. I think it was COVID. What do you think? Well, based on the genetic evidence, it suggests to us that no, we think this virus has been circulating more recently than that. And it also implies that we don't expect large levels of immunity in the human population. So that's I, I've never really thought about that because I think of uh, on the tree of life generally I think about that idea of, uh, of, of 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 the last common ancestor when we go and then we see all of these but I never think of that for some reason there's that kind of idea that with an infectious disease uh, perhaps because of the paranoid conspiracy theories as well mm. that they just kind of happen. So the web of life that we might imagine if we look at uh, uh, one of those illustrations of, of Darwin's ideas on the war, that, that is as, as relevant to an infectious disease as well. Yeah, absolutely. And um, really relevant because in terms of things like, um, you know, bacterial viruses, they're mutating much more quickly than, than us, for example. So we have more power to resolve changes through time for these more rapidly evolving organisms than, than we would do for something that evolves more slowly like, like us. How much more difficult is it in terms of the speed of mutation? Because uh, this might have all changed now, but I remember someone telling me that, that COVID-19 is actually reasonably stable. It doesn't mutate at a, 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 you know, at a rapid rate, whereas something like, I suppose, most famously HIV and in, into AIDS, that has a rapid mutation. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's kind of correct that in terms of uh, virus land or... Um yeah, certainly for viruses, um, SARS-CoV-2, this virus doesn't mutate particularly quickly. It's an RNA virus. It also has um, kind of a unique protein that all coronaviruses have, which um, acts like a proofreading mechanism. So in, in many ways, any sporadic errors that are induced when the virus replicates, this proofreading mechanism tries to catch those out. At the same time, if we look at other coronaviruses, so there's, there's very many other coronaviruses, um, so SARS, MERS, um, but many of them infect um, you know, endemic ones in humans and also in animals, the rates are all quite quite similar. So it's not overly fast, but it's still fast compared to other things. Um, if we are to use exactly the same method to apply to, for example, TB, um, so mycobacterium tuberculosis, this evolves much more slowly. And so if I wanted to do the same kind of analysis, then I'm actually relying on having, for example, very old or historic samples, um, even ancient DNA samples, in order to be able to conduct the same kind of analysis 
because like I said, it relies on this premise that you have mutations correlating or accumulating over time. And if they don't accumulate fast enough, then you don't have enough resolution to sort of pinpoint an origin. So viruses are useful in that regard. <laughs> So when you start, and you, you've explained to some, some extent, I'm, I'm really interested in, in thinking of now where, you know, th th this is in terms of a time where people uh, are often misled as well and, and have misunderstandings um, uh, about the spread of viruses, the spread of coronavirus. Um, what is the starting point? Are you, for someone as a computational biologist in population genetics, when it first, when you first hear news of this, when when, when you, in, in your research, how what's the first kind of day's work where does it wh how where do you start i guess uh, start one is identifying the pathogen <laughs> so what is it and um you know this is not work that i did the work that was done in, in china which was to say well we have this viral pneumonia we've got an increase in cases um what is it is it something that we already have and it's acquired say a virulence gene and become more infectious um, or is it something completely newly emerging? And so that was really fundamental, at least in the start of this pandemic, was to identify the fact and sequence the genome of a brand new coronavirus. It already allowed us to say this isn't something we've seen before. Um, and then the question really is, where does it, it come from? And, and like I've mentioned, coronaviruses are really very common in animals. And, and the, you know, the most likely scenario is that we have a mutation in a viral reservoir in um, an animal host, maybe bats, um, which then acquires a mutation which allows it to transmit into humans and uh, we call these host jumps and, and they're not uncommon we have host jumps all, all the time so in, in that sense it's a it's a rapid event it's a, um, a mutation which allows a transmission in a, in a new host and in fact almost all of the diseases you know that we still suffer with tuberculosis malaria um, plague they, they all are from these host jumps um, from zoonotic animal reservoirs and so for this coronavirus, you know, we have a, a mutation, we have a jump, and then we can start to ask, well, what's what's happening? We have this in circulation in the human genome. And this is, again, when having one genome is useful, we have identified the pathogen. But if we have more genomes, then we can start to ask questions about uh, mutation rates. We can say, well, how does this compare to the first one, <laughs> which is important? Do we have multiple jumps into the human population? Do we have one single jump and then spread, which is what we see here? Um, and then we can start to say, well, when are two genomes more similar to each other? When are they more different? And this already allows you to start to ask questions about how much transmission you might have within a community versus, say, imported cases. Um, and it also allows you to make some kind of public health decisions about, about how quickly this thing is evolving and, and spreading. You've, you've talked about, I mean, I, I love that phrase, you know, the, the, the post-genomic revolution. <laughs> and it does seem to I've, I've talked to other people about this when you think of it look at the history of diseases and you see now the tools and the possibility of understanding and predicting can you give me just some sense of what that post-genomic revolution mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. I think um, sort of using that phrase is really to highlight the the volume the number and the information source we know, now have at our disposal um I'm going to end up keeping on going back to SARS-CoV-2 because it's what I'm working on right now. But, you know, here we have a scenario where since the beginning of January, there's now um, about 78,000 genomes that are publicly available. So that's, you know, extraordinary in, in terms of the number of genomes that have been sequenced. And in fact, if you track the, the rate of upload, you know, you get these exponential curves that look very much like the virus taking off it, itself in terms of the way people have been sequencing. And to put that into perspective, if you go back to, say, the um, swine flu um, epidemic, you and maybe two months into into that, we had maybe 11 partial genomes. It's a paper published in Science at, at that point. And so um, at the same point in this pandemic, we had over 10,000. <laughs> so we really have a huge amount of data and that opens up possibilities. And there's, it's not just possibilities in terms of just data, but it's also what we can do with it. And so um really at this point in time we need to think about how we can use genomics and coming with that is how we use genomics responsibly it's um you know a, a rich source of information which carries a lot of uh information on for example what disease someone might be affected with or what genetic traits they might be um they might carry or or potentially have future um, diseases and so we need to think carefully about how we use this but certainly um there's huge movements now to take uh, sequencing into the field, so directly to sites of um, epidemics or um, even just to kind of um, facilitate taxonomic efforts in the field. I know Kew Gardens are doing some sequencing going around and 
um, sequencing their specimens. And and this is uh, something that's quite new. You know, we're, it's, we're at the point of having handheld sequencing technology, and that's something which is is really new and it offers opportunities for sequencing to be quite decentralized and much more cost effective. Um, at the same time, we have, for example, um, a huge potential for sequencing in, say, clinical diagnostics. So many, many pathogens that cause us problems in hospitals, um, some of those will not be, you'll not be able to culture quickly. Um, they don't grow particularly well, sometimes they're difficult to diagnose. And, and sequencing offers us opportunities to, for example, take a sample from a patient to sequence it in a completely agnostic way, um, hypothesis free and say, well, what's there? And um, already that's starting to kind of reveal new insights into the kind of pathogens that are responsible, for example, um, in sepsis, um, but also in terms of making rapid diagnostic decisions. So um, getting to the point where we have sequencing data, which we can start to make decisions using at a time scale, which is relevant for patients, for example. Um, I mean, this is. I'll just ask you one final thing, which is because you you are involved in um, kind of constructing the evolutionary history of infectious diseases. Do you also have times sometimes where you do look back, and do you have do you do you still have an active interest in looking at the stories of certain outbreaks that we've seen in in human civilization and thinking now, if I was able to deal with that now, does that actually by sometimes framing that those situations which were not able to be controlled does it give you both inspiration and also another level of understanding yeah i think so and i think you know on a purely human level we should really consider the fact that pandemics have been throughout our history you know we've faced many and humanity has survived so this is not an unusual um scenario in in many ways even if it's unusual at the scale of say someone's lifetime um and I guess one, one question is that for a lot of those pandemics, so um, good examples like the Coccolitsa in South America, the plague of Athens, um, you know, we even actually the, the Russian flu pandemic, we're not that sure what, what the agent was. So that's talking at like 1889, 1890. So not that far ago. Um, we don't actually know the agents of these things. <laughs> so I think that's really interesting as well. It highlights that, you know, we've experienced all these things, but actually that quest to like know the pathogen and there's been endless historical accounts of possible um, symptoms, pathogens, ailments throughout time, all given weird and wonderful names. Um, that's something which, of course, has, has fascinated people. And one of my kind of really, kind of one of the interests that I really have and I'm very passionate about is trying to learn something from past pandemics, from past events. And um, I should have mentioned talking about opportunities with sequencing. One of the major opportunities and changes we've had going forward is the ability to sequence ancient DNA. So DNA from archaeological material, historic material, and this is, is challenging. It's degraded. It's old. Um, it doesn't. You can't really treat it the same way you would a modern sample. But um, ancient DNA kind of methods are really giving us massively new insights. They they don't rely on, for example, the kind of tools I work on to infer what happened in the past. They provide direct observations. And so the most famous example is kind of the interbreeding of, of Homo sapiens and Neanderthals, which was evidence from the Neanderthal genome. But this also holds true for pathogens. So um, the first kind of ancient pathogen genome was a Yersinia pestis or plague genome back in 2011. And, and since then, there's really been a, a takeoff in terms of the number of ancient pathogen sequences available. And so this allows you to start to ask, well, actually, if I have a known historical pandemic, I have, um, for example, a mass grave associated with that pandemic, can I sequence DNA from those individuals and under identify the, the causative pathogen? And in, in many cases, actually, that's not proving as easy as, as we would think. Sometimes we're like, this is a plague pit and um, you find no use in your pestis at all. And, and potentially it's something else. Um, but also what it's always also allowing us to do is to obtain genomes from diseases of the past. So pre-interventions, maybe from eradicated or extinct lineages um, that can allow us to make really good estimates of, for example, rates of mutations, so this calibration idea, um, because we have such a long time scale. And really, every almost every time that we have a good ancient sample um, from a from a pathogen, we find that it pushes back the age of that pathogen. So we find that um, good examples recently are both smallpox and measles, which ancient DNA samples have pushed back how long we think they've been infected in humans by thousands of years. Um, so it can really reveal some important insights into how a pathogen goes from maybe just circulating in animals, being a commensal, moving into humans, potentially becoming more virulent or being able to transmit in, in different hosts, 
um, and in some cases either going extinct or in others staying with us to this day. Lucy and her colleagues are in the process of using this genetic information to tackle things like COVID-19. And as Mark mentioned, there is no end to the uses of gaining sequences for as much of life on Earth as possible. Mark also spoke of how the whole process can feel like magic as the technology involved with sequencing gets better and better. A final guest for this episode is someone working on continuing to improve that technology. Professor Jay Shinduri is a human geneticist at the University of Washington School of Medicine in Seattle, and his lab is one of the world's pioneers in exome sequencing. So can you can you explain a little bit about what is exome so sequencing? So only about 1% of your three billion letter genome actually codes for proteins, which are in turn the building blocks um, for you know building cells and building building um, organisms, um, and so you know in the, in the early days, uh, genome sequencing costs had dropped from you know a billion to a million, right? But that's still very expensive, um, and so we developed these methods to just sequence the one percent of the genome that contain these these protein coding sequences, the most important part, um, and we were able to use that to. Uh, show kind of a new approach for for identifying genes underlying rare diseases, but the same approach has been extended, and you know hundreds, you know probably millions of people have ha ha millions of people have had their exome sequence, even if only you know tens of thousands or probably soon hundreds of thousands of their genome sequence. So it's kind of the leading edge where we're pushing into the larger and larger populations because it's much cheaper. Um, but you get you get a lot of bang for your buck. I want to go back to your PhD, if I can, as well, just to yeah, get sure. uh, a nice definition in, in terms of uh, involving the successful proof of concepts of next generation DNA sequencing. So can you explain to people what that means? Yeah, so it was uh, one of the first reductions to practice of actually doing what's called massively parallel sequencing, where you have, you know, thousands or to millions to billions of um, fragments of, of DNA scattered over a microscope slide and you're sequencing them all at once with the microscope. Historically, people had done this one at a time. So if I want to sequence this piece of DNA, I put it in its own tube, its own container, and I, I look at it with a, a series of biochemical steps. What we were doing differently was really spreading out lots of DNA on a slide and then by virtue of imaging the entire slide, um, we were able to, to, to decipher um, uh, many independent subsequences of DNA, which we could then assemble back into a gene. How have techniques of sequencing changed in the period of time since this began? So, so going way back right so back to 1977 when when dna sequencing technologies were developed i mean we were really only able to read you know a, a handful of letters at a time right of these nucleotides or letters right and it would take days you know or, or week-long experiments just to read those um an enormous amount of effort went into automating those early technologies which uh you know those automated forms of, of what was called Sanger sequencing, named after uh, Fred Sanger um, from the UK, uh, resulted in um, our ability to sequence the, the human genome, you know, at a cost of a billion dollars and an effort involving thousands of people over, over many years. And then, you know, just a, a, a few years after that, these, these newer massively parallel or next generation technologies came online. Um, and with those, the cost of DNA sequencing started to drop faster than Moore's law, right? So over the span of about a decade, it simply plummeted um, to the point where, you know, now we're, we're maybe at, you know, to sequence a, a human genome, an individual human genome, something that would have cost, you know, on the order of a billion dollars uh, just, just 20 years ago now is a few thousand dollars, right? Um, and so it's, it's remarkable. It's, it's seeing it, you know, not just lifetime, but my, you know, my, my, my career since being a, a, an, an undergraduate to now, the cost has dropped by a factor of, you know, a billion. It's crazy. 
even with scientific optimism, does if you if you look back to you know 1999, do you feel that the the speed has been far faster than uh, we would have imagined, or do you think this is what may have been imagined? Anyone, with the exception of maybe one or two people, anticipated this. Um, you know, I in in 2000 around. 2003, and sort of when I was in graduate school and kind of, and, you know, entering and doing some of the early work in, in next generation sequencing as a graduate student with George Church, um, he, he dropped in a sentence into a paper that said something to the effect of, if we can optimize this technology, you know, a billion fold, we will achieve the thousand dollar genome. And, and it seemed absurd. And we kept trying to take the sentence out of the paper and he kept putting it back in. <laughs> so, um, so I think even we, you know, even while we were developing some of the technologies that, that would contribute to this, um, I don't think we even realized it, but George did. Does that ever get tough when you think the, 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 the speed of obsolescence that, that kicks in? I mean, we, we've talked before on this about the, the speed of obsolescence of popular genetics books. You know, there's that bit where you go, ah, oh, just finished the book and it turns out chapter five to nine can go. <laughs> and in the same way, with, in, in terms of the, the speed of the technology that you're dealing with changing. I think it can be hard, but if you, if you consider the alternative, right, which is that things are static and staying the same and, and not changing, I think uh, that's far less preferred. Right. And so, you know, now we're in a regime where things are stabilized. There's a bit of a monopoly and, you know, hopefully it's temporary uh, where one company is really dominating. And, and we have seen things stabilize a bit for the last five years or so. And so we've seen it both ways now. And I would definitely prefer the, the, the fast change over the over the static uh, version of this. What I mean, we've we've been talking with people about things like you know some of the nanopore technology and 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 the fact that also the the, the scale required as well, the fact that we're looking at things being done quite literally almost in the field now. What are the problems that need to be overcome? So nanopore, nanopore technology for DNA sequencing is is absolutely incredible. I think it still is is I would call it complementary to some of the other technologies, and really the key the key challenge there relates to um, error, right? And, and the error rate simply being too high still, uh, for some goals, right? If I want to, you know, if I'm in the field and I want to know, you know, what species this, this particular plant is or something like that, that's an application that can tolerate a pretty high error. Uh, however, if I'm sequencing a human genome and there's, there's much less tolerance for mistakes, if I'm going to act on that information in some clinical way, um, it has to be really, really, really good. Um, and it's not there yet. Then again, it's only been a couple years since these technologies um, really matured into the, the, the limelight, so to speak. And so I, I do think there's still a lot of room for further improvement um, and getting there, right? But that, that last mile is something that's still there. Can you give us a, a, a breakdown of, of, of your specific kind of research and work with gene sequencing? Yeah, so my, my career spans, you know, kind of develop, you know, working on the development of some of these newer sequencing technologies and then applying them to um, discover genes that contribute to rare genetic diseases, um, uh, what we call Mendelian or, or monogenic diseases. And then in more recent years, we've transition to kind of combining um, gene editing technologies and gene sequencing technologies. So an example of this uh, would be, um, you know, we, we can take a genome. Like, so one of the challenges with genome sequencing is that many of the changes that we see in your genome or my genome are difficult to interpret. I can't tell if I see a mutation in BRCA1, which is a known breast cancer gene, whether it's going to kill that gene or whether the gene product will be perfectly fine. And so we've set about using a, a combination of gene editing and, and gene sequencing to basically make and test all possible changes in a gene like BRCA1 in the lab so that when we observe them in a patient, we can interpret whether they, they will have an effect or not on your breast cancer risk. So when, for instance, just you're talking about 
the accuracy and and, uh, and and managing to refine that. I mean, how much does a pitch change? Just for instance, in a very small change in the ability to read accuracy, how what do we then see as the ramifications? I just wondered if there's any specific uh, examples you can give. So, um, well, just, I'll go back to the beginning of, of my career. Is you know when this was back in the day when we were less stringent about not you know not using our own DNA for experiments in the lab, and so. Someone had, uh, a colleague of mine, Rob Mitra, had been sequencing himself, right, to see whether he was lactose intolerant. And he, I remember him running out, you know, into the room and saying, I got great news, I'm not lactose intolerant. And then, like, he came back a few minutes later, I, I read the gel wrong, I am lactose intolerant. <laughs> so, so that's kind of a minor, right, a minor um, ramification. But, you know, there are in, an increasing number of um, genes where, the result of sequencing is medically actionable, right? So for example, in the example I gave of BRCA1, the reason we're interested in interpreting those variations is because there's something life-saving that you can do. You can have a mastectomy, um, a, a, you know, a, a bilateral mastectomy and basically eliminate the risk of breast cancer for the rest of your life if you, if you um, have a pathogenic or disease-causing mutation. So if I'm the one who's sequencing and I get that wrong, Right, I would lead someone to have a radical surgery that that uh, was actually not necessary. Right, um, by the same token, it's not just the sequencing. I could get the sequencing right, but get the interpretation of it wrong. Right, so there there's a lot in there, and I think um, particularly when things become medically actionable, the stakes become quite a bit higher. Right. Well, I'm also interested. When did when did the rules come in that you were no longer allowed to use your own uh, yourself? Uh, they, they may have been there at the time. <laughs> uh, I think we've just gotten more. Um, you know, I remember right when I was starting in research. You know, the, this is at at the hospital for special surgery in Manhattan. You know, if we were doing a study, the docs would walk around and they would just like they would just draw blood on random people in the hallway who were doing research. Just kind of borrow you for five minutes to to grab some blood, right? And and I think as we become you know more sensitive to I think the importance of proper consent around things like that, as well as just uh, privacy of genetic information uh, and the importance of that and how that can have negative consequences um, in in some societies where we're not as protective of those things. Um, I think we've we've generally gotten better about it. There is, uh, I, I was just thinking, it, 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 that level of excitement when someone sees their genome, though, I think I've, I've never had that, but I have seen my own brain. And that moment <laughs> where you have a brain scan, and then you look at your brain and you go, that. and I wondered in terms of that, that, that sense when you go, that's that's it, there's the code. This is this is what makes me, and that, you know, I can imagine there's a tremendous level of excitement. Dev, there's those A's, those C's, those T's. And, right? and you realize, you know, it's all just this big digital code, right? And and um, I mean, obviously, that's a that's an abstraction, um, uh, you know. But it's a it's a real thing, right? There's you can fit on the USB drive uh, a thousand times over the information content required to produce a, a human, right? And to do it consistently, right? Because we're all ninety nine point nine percent the same, right? So it's this one code, and it's. You know, for me, you know, that moment is also when you when you line up the sequences of different species um, and you see just that deep similarity between a human and a marmoset or an orangutan. I mean, to me, that's just like it just you feel this very profound sense of belonging to, to something. Right. And, um, you know, I think as close as genetics can get to being spiritual for me is that is that kind of connection to the evolutionary tree that you see when you when you're lining up sequences on a. Of, of letters on a, on a screen, right? Well, that's what I, I, I think psychologically it is a really empowering piece of science, as you said, for that psychological effect of of connection. Exactly as you're saying, that that to me is a very beautiful thing when we see, I, I know it's not a tree of life anymore. I know it's a really weird river with these tributaries <laughs> right in and out. I, I, I know the picture has changed, but within that picture, within, and I know some people don't like web, you know, we haven't necessarily found the, uh, the, the metaphor that, that will, will fit it. But that level of connection and that level to me is such a rich picture when you consider some of 
the the pictures that people you know with darwin when there was a point where people say well, well darwin it, because it's not uh disprovable therefore it's not science and you go each time you get a new piece of information you go this makes it more and more you know fits in with with popper and genetics is to me that really important moment that beautiful moment yeah and I, was, I was at the i was at the zoo yesterday and and you know making eye contact with an orangutan and you know Telling my kids about the, you know, like you, it really does all fit together, and I do think that that it is, um, you know, it's nice to see it in person when you can see the orangutan, but you can also look at the orangutan's DNA sequence and line it up so well to your own, right? That's also kind of coming at it from the other angle, right? And I think they're the I think they're the best ones to to communicate with as well. There's something about there's not the same. You've got to admit with chimpanzees there's a level of threat and <laughs> with both that there can be a level point. of sexual yeah. anticipation. You know, it's dangerous <laughs> business, really, isn't it? Um, I, w I wanted to uh, also ask you in, in in terms of what what when I asked you about the dream scenario in terms of sequencing, le let's have two, which is one which is a foreseeable dream. And the one which is, you know, and they might be the same thing. And the other is in your imagination where that that dream sequence so might I, be. I think the the foreseeable one is, you know, the ubiquitous genome sequence that's part of your medical record, right? And that deeply informs your your risk for both rare and common diseases. And that being an affordable and you know thing in 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 societies with with developed healthcare um where there's sufficient resources you know let's say it was ten dollars or a hundred dollars that ends up being a small fraction of the cost of healthcare over your life and the value add is there right i think the dream scenario has to also include um you know not exploiting that information right for all kinds of reasons in which um genetic information can have can have negative consequences um if if used or interpreted improperly um uh, so, so uh, you know, I think from a societal perspective, I think trying to achieve the benefits while not incurring the harms, right? Um, you know, in the U.S., we have to think much more about things like denial of, of life insurance and, and, and things like that that you don't have to think about in your end. So to get, today it's legal to deny someone health insurance for, you know, for based on their genetic profiling. Not health insurance, life insurance, sorry. Um, you know, so if we can achieve the benefits without the cost, I think that would be golden. Uh, you know, the, the dream scenario, I imagine, is where the further dream scenario that's a bit more out there um, is, you know, this goes back to your talking about nanopore sequencing, um, you know, tricorders, right? Where we, we basically, from Star Trek, where you're walking around and, you know, basically every living thing that you can find gets cataloged into some almost like a bio, like a, like a bio map. Right of of life across the planet extending far beyond humans, and I think that kind of a a biomap could be extremely powerful for everything from um, conservation efforts to staving off pandemics. Right, um, and so I do think there's also a, a potential future there with ubiquitous, cheap, and portable sequencing. Thank you for watching and thank you to the Genetic Society and the Milner Centre for Evolution who we're producing this series with. Uh, we are Cosmic Shambles Network and you can catch up on all past episodes in video form on the Cosmic Shambles YouTube channel or at cosmicshambles.com slash genetic shambles. Or you can listen to a podcast version on the Genetics Unzipped podcast hosted by Kat Arney. Our next episode will be live on August the 26th, where I'll be joined by Kat Arney and others to talk about the genetics of cancer. Bye for now.